Check, check. Hey, Tom. This is the one that Ron normally uses, I think, for Nancy.
if you're able for our opening hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, number 127. Welcome to Indianola First United Methodist Church, and welcome to those of you who are joining us online this morning. My name is Mary Corsair, and it's really good to have you in worship with us this morning. A reminder to please find and fill out the attendance pads that are in the black folder found in your pews so we know that you have been with us this morning. And if you are the last one to fill that out, would you please tear out that top page, pass it to the inner aisle end of your pew, and then the black folder goes to the window side, and that would help us. Also, if you are visiting with us this morning, we invite you to visit our welcome desk, which is just outside the double doors at the back of the sanctuary. And on that welcome desk, there is a little basket with packets for visitors. And so we invite you to take one of those with just a little bit more information about our church. We have several announcements this morning. First of all, our summer series with the Des Moines Metro Opera continues today. And we welcome our guest musician. And thank you to all of those who have made contributions possible through our opera fund. Today we welcomed new members into our congregation at the 915 service or 9 o'clock service. We welcome Tara Porter and Eric Broderick, and we are so glad to have them in our church family. Finally, join us on July 30th as we celebrate Ellen Wright and her work. She has given so much to our church, and we want to bless her as she enters a new journey in school counseling, which I can relate to. That was my profession. And there will be a presentation during services, followed by a reception during hospitality time in between the services. So please remember that coming up in two weeks. Pastor Tim, do you have anything? All right. So these are just some of the things going on around our church at this time. Please check your bulletin as well as the latest messenger newsletter for more. 
And now, if you are able, would you please stand and greet one another? And if you do not personally know the people worshiping around you, would you please introduce yourself? Now, if you would please join me in our opening prayer. Thank you, God, that it is your desire that no one is condemned, but that all of us know life in Christ. Help us also not to condemn others, but instead welcome them with your love. Amen. Now, remain standing if you are able for our opening song, number 2222, out of the Black Hymnal, The Servant Song. First reading this morning comes from Psalm 119. Please join me in reading the bold text as indicated on this screen. Hear these words. Your word is a lamp before my feet and a light for my journey. I have sworn 
and I fully mean it. I will keep your righteous rules. I have been suffering so much. Lord, make me live again according to your promise. Please, Lord, accept my spontaneous gifts of praise. Teach me your rules. Though my life is constantly in danger, I won't forget your instruction. Though the wicked have set a trap for me, I won't stray from your precepts. Your laws are my possession forever because they are my heart's joy. I have decided to keep your statutes forever, every last one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As Zach is not here, I want to just thank Alexis, Alexis uh, Seminario, for being with us today from the DMMO. We so appreciate the Des Moines Metro Opera and all the musicians who, who give us their, share their gifts with us. And welcome. We're so glad you're here today. And thank you, Jean, for accompanying her today. Thank you so much. It's beautiful, beautiful. Today uh, I'm reading from Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. And I'm reading from Genesis uh, 25, verse 19 uh, through 34, that looks like a smidge of a longer passage, but it's a story. So, you know, you can't skip the story. 
and so this is the story of Jacob and Esau, their birth and a little bit of their relationship or lack of relationship maybe might be more accurate. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham became, became the father of Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean, from Padan Aram. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife since she was unable to have children. The Lord was moved by his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. But the boys pushed against each other inside of her, and she said, if this is what it's like, why did this happen to me? So she went to ask the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two different peoples will emerge from your body. One people will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. When she reached the end of her pregnancy, she discovered she had twins. The first came out red all over, clothed with hair, and she named him Esau. Immediately afterwards, his brother came out gripping Esau's heel, and she named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. When the young men grew up, Esau became an outdoorsman who knew how to hunt, and Jacob became a quiet man who stayed at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was boiling stew, Esau came in from the field hungry and said to Jacob, I am starving. Let me devour some of that red stuff. Thus where he got his name Edom, which by the way means red. Jacob said, sell me your birthright today. Esau said, since I'm going to die anyway, what good is my birthright to me? And Jacob said, give me your word today. And he did. He sold his birthright to Jacob. So Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. He ate, drank, got up and left, showing just how little he thought of his birthright. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The relationship between Jacob and Esau makes for some really interesting reading. If you want to read more of Genesis, you find out that they war with each other uh, quite a bit. And um, um, Esau is a very straightforward guy, and Jacob, frankly, is kind of sneaky. Jacob, the name Jacob, really goes back to a word, root word that means trickster. And he, play, he pulls one over on Esau more than once. And so he takes away, he gets him to give him his birthright. But it's so strange, isn't it? Esau comes in, and he's been out hunting. And so he, he probably didn't have enough provisions with him. And he's out hunting, and he comes back in, and he's starving. And Jacob, who stays at home and likes to stay close to home, um, he, he was cooking stew and Esau said, I'll take some of that. And Jacob said, fine, give me your birthright. Esau says, okay. And Jacob says, no, I mean it. Promise me. And Esau says, well, I'm about to starve to death. I guess I'll just go ahead and give you my birthright. Sure, sure. Later, of course, Esau greatly resents what he got talked into doing because it's such a bizarre thing. The birthright is a big deal. The birthright is a big deal. Part of the birthright is that you should be, as the eldest son in their society, the one who leads the family. Esau would have been the leader of the family. It would have been his decision what the family did and where the family went and how they made decisions. And he said he was giving that away. It even involved inheritance. I think I've said before, as the eldest in my family, my approval of this system, the uh, eldest son uh, gets a double portion of the inheritance. That's what it says in the Old Testament. Only seems logical, right? So since there was just Esau and Jacob, they would have divided up the inheritance not into two parts, but into three. And Esau was basically saying he was giving away a third of what he would, you know, or half of what he was going to get, a third of the inheritance. It doesn't make any sense. 
for some momentary satisfaction. I mean, after all, won't he be hungry again in a few hours, no matter how good this stew might be? Giving away your birthright for, as the King James says, a mess of pottage. I've been thinking about that a lot lately when I think about um, United Methodists and who we are as United Methodists. We're a people with a heritage, a long heritage, all the way back to John Wesley. John and Charles Wesley, Susanna Wesley, those who helped them start the Methodist movement, who started a revival within the Church of England that spread into the, into the colonies and became the first Methodist church, was here in the United States, the Christmas Conference in 1784. And it's caused me to think about how people seem to be willing to give away their heritage for lesser things. You know and I know that the United Methodist Church is going through a time of division. If you didn't know it from me, you could have got it from the newspaper. It's been, it's been in uh, the Des Moines Register. It's been in local papers. It's been on the Internet uh, that we are going through a time when churches are choosing to leave. But when you get right down to it, the really strange thing about it is they're not leaving largely over the desire to be more Methodist than they've been before. What is it that makes us United Methodists? Are we better than other Christians? Of course not. But we have our own distinctive practices, and when we became, you know, when, when we were United Methodists, we were learned about those practices. I'm a convert to the United Methodist faith. Um, I had somebody uh, uh, who, at my first church I was appointed to as the associate who was known for being somebody with kind of a sense of humor, was kind of teasing me about my conversion to uh, United Methodism. He said, why did you become a Methodist? And so I just looked him right in the eye and I said, my heart was strangely warmed. But, you know, when I became a United Methodist, one of the things I was expected to do was to learn about things that were distinctively United Methodist. I took some classes in United Methodist doctrine. And so in my first appointment and, and my, my, some of my other opportunities, I have tried to preach about our heritage and our, and our beliefs. And they cover the two areas that are most distinctively United Methodist, I believe, are the way we look at our beliefs and our way we look at grace in particular. United Methodists quite openly say that we make our decisions about what we believe based on Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. I was at a Benedictine monastery this week on a retreat. I'll have to tell you a lot of detail about that sometime. You might think, why was Tim doing that? I'll tell you about that sometime. I really find Benedictine spirituality very interesting. But one of our speakers was a monk uh, who goes by the name Father Cip or excuse me, Brother Cyprian. He's not ordained, Brother Cyprian. And Brother Cyprian actually said in his conversation around spirituality uh, about you know issues in our own society, and it was interesting how often I found myself nodding my head in agreement. And one of the things that Brother Cyprian said was that. Faith without reason equals fundamentalism. Faith without reason equals fundamentalism. Why? Because if you have faith, but you don't reason your faith, then what usually happens is you end up with a very black and white faith where this is always clearly and all for time eternity wrong, and this is always clearly and all for time eternity right, but it doesn't take into account anything that's happened in the 2,000 years uh, since the biblical authors penned their work. It doesn't take into account science or new discoveries or, or what we've learned uh, in, 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 other, in, our, in our Christian life or what we've learned from our predecessors in the faith. It just assumes everything's like it was 2,000 years ago. And, and so it leads to a fundamentalism which causes people to focus focus very narrowly into becoming largely single-issue Christians. So there are churches that not only 
say there's a second coming, which United Methodists say so, but they say in all their writings exactly how it's going to come and which theory of the second coming you've got to believe to be in their church. And, and uh, uh, we, we as United Methodists say we believe in the incarnation of Jesus Christ and we believe in the faith of Christ and that Jesus saves us, but there are other ways of looking at the faith that not only say that, but say, well, there are these theories of atonement and you have to believe this one. But United Methodists have always been a very broad church, a, very, a church where people have lots of views, and that's been one of our strengths. But what I fear has happened with, with at least some of the folks who are choosing to take their churches other places is that they have chosen to, to leave their heritage, to leave what they were raised in, to leave what their children were baptized in, to leave what their grandparents came from, to leave their history over issues that are not even found in our doctrinal statements, that aren't even found in the ecumenical creeds of the church that aren't even found in the Apostles' Creed, that John Wesley would have never even heard of, and that probably we'll all think differently about in the next 15 to 20 years anyway. And in my my mind, they're in the process of selling their birthright for a bowl of stew. Now, I like stew. I like stew. And I like certain kinds of stew, just like, for example, my favorite holiday item, deviled eggs. I love deviled eggs. However, there is pretty much one recipe of deviled eggs that I really want. And it's actually Michelle's recipe handed down to her from her mother. That's the one I want to eat. I don't want to eat any of the others. It's not that they're not good, but they're not the right deviled eggs, you know. They're not the right deviled eggs. Well, of course, the problem with that attitude is, if I only ever sample the one kind I really love the most, look what I miss out on. I miss out on your deviled eggs, which have a whole other recipe that's probably really great. Or I miss out on eating something other than deviled eggs, Because while I really honestly say you can't have too many deviled eggs, you probably can. It seems like a really dangerous thing, or at least an inadvisable thing, to throw away all the other possibilities on one thing. And look, look at what Esau gave away. He got to eat his favorite stew. Wow. And that'll be gone. What I worry about in not just our church, but all the mainstream churches, is that we, we too easily are letting the culture tell us that we have to be right, and we have to divide, and we have to do these things. And, and so, United Methodists are one of the seven sisters of the main line. That's the seven main line churches. See, if I can get it right, I always have trouble not getting all seven. American Baptists, United Methodists, Disciples of Christ, the Episcopal Church, um, the Presbyterian Churches USA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. I always miss the seventh one. Protestants. Hmm? Did I? Okay, I'll come up with it later. There are seven out of us, honestly. And we are the seventh and last of the churches to divide over the issues we're dividing over, human sexuality and other things. We are the seventh church, and yes, we didn't learn anything by the other six splits, and we're doing it anyway. Now, truthfully, you can't make people stay in a denomination, and you can't make people stay in a church, and I'm not advocating that. But what I am seeing and and concerned about is that I honestly believe a fair number of those churches and at least a fair number of those members of those churches down the road will wish they hadn't done it. And frankly, I hope that the United Methodist Church comes for our, creates a mechanism at one of our future general conferences to allow churches to return if they change their mind. Because what I'm afraid they're going to discover is, is that this bowl of stew that is being right 
tastes good right now, but when it's the only stew you've got to eat, are you going to get tired of it? When the only thing that makes you distinctive is that you, you're not one of them, when the only thing that makes you special is you're the not United Methodists, how long will it be before that loses meaning? Uh, I have some experience with this. I, I, grew up in another, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Convention as a, as a boy many moons ago. And there was a split in that denomination where a group spun off called the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. I have friends of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. It's a good group, good group of Christians. But they've had their struggles, and one of the things that they've struggled with is being something other than not the Southern Baptists. You see, if you head off in some other direction, you need to pick a direction, but you have to get past being not those people. I mean, United Meth or Methodism broke off the Church of England, and I never hear Methodists say anymore, you know, the most important thing about being Methodist is we're not in the Church of England. We don't say that. That's long past history. That's not, imp not that the Church of England isn't important, but that's not an important part of our history now. I hope that those who chosen to eat the meal they've chosen to eat don't someday recognize, though I fear they will, that it's a limited diet. That a narrow faith, a faith that really doesn't allow for a lot of deviation, also doesn't allow for a lot of people, or for a lot of connection, or, or for a lot of, of, of growth. One of the things I enjoy about hearing things from people of other faith backgrounds, like the experience I had this weekend on retreat, is you can really learn a lot from people who think very differently than you do, who view the world and their life experience very differently. You can learn a great deal. But if you decide you're always only going to eat the same devil egg, the same bowl of soup, the same meal, and listen to the same people and do exactly the same thing, besides being bored, you're probably not going to grow. And so one of the things that I hope and pray for United Methodists is that in the future, whatever may come with those who choose to head off other directions, that we will remain a broad, broad church. That we will say to each other and to ourselves and to those around us, you don't have to agree with everything we think to be a part of our, of our church. You don't have to you don't have to understand everything the way we understand everything. You don't have to dot all the I's or cross all the T's the same way. Certainly we have broad things we agree on. The grace of God through Jesus Christ. We have broad things we agree on. But we agree broadly on those, frankly, with our Lutheran sisters and brothers and our Catholic sisters and brothers and our Presbyterian sisters and brothers, and you get the idea. We don't want to lose our birthright. We don't want to lose our birthright. I'm proud that we are part of the United Methodist Church. I was not a, Method, a United Methodist born, but I expect to eventually someday be a United Methodist gone. I'm glad we're staying because I see the light of Christ in what United Methodists hope for. We're not always there. We're not always doing all we ought to do. But God knows that we must keep trying. And when we become the fully open and caring church God calls us to be, that will be a birthright worth hanging on to with all we have. Let's pray. Lord, I'm thankful for this denomination and this church. Today I lift up in prayer our bishop, Kenitha Bigham Sai, our district superintendent, Ron Carlson, the Iowa Conference, and I lift up the United Methodist Church before you, Lord. 
When I come to the banquet of the United Methodist Church, Lord, I see lots of dishes. I see lots of things that I can try and do. I see lots of ways that people have prepared their faith that are different than mine, but give them the nourishment and sustenance. Help United Methodists to never be satisfied or give away our birthright for a measly bowl of lentil soup. Help us to realize, Lord, that the faith of Jesus Christ is above and beyond those things that make us different and that you have created us out of your love. Help us to grow in your grace until every person in this community could walk in this building and feel the loving welcome of Jesus. For it's in in Christ's name, always. Amen. We're going to share in some responsive music together. Lift every voice from the United Methodist Hymnal 519. for us to share in praises and prayer concerns. And I'm going to step down 
among you all so I can hear better. We want to uh, continue to lift up in prayer Darla Kickbush, Dixie Rubel, Kelly Bonas, Twyla Wilkinson, Harrison Rowe, Betty Haddix, and Marjorie Bees. Do we have additional praises, prayers, concerns, birthdays, anniversaries? Oh, yes. Just. Kim Burns diagnosed with cancer this week, stage, stage four, and th thank you, thank you. Yes. Prayers for people who are dealing with fires, thank you, and certainly prayers for our air quality right now. If you're a person with lung issues, be careful outside out there today. Others? Oh, yes, Doug. Yes, it was great to have Tara and Eric uh, join us in the first service this morning, and we've got some other folks who are going to be joining us in the coming weeks, so that's a, a blessing. It's a fun thing to welcome people in officially. Anyone else? All right. Well, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Loving Christ, we thank you for those, who, for those who have given us the heritage that we have, the faith that we have, and we thank you for Jesus Christ who gives us life. We lift up those who are hurting, particularly family members who have been mentioned who are, who are fighting cancer or other illnesses. We lift up those who are recovering from surgeries, those who are experiencing long-term health issues. We pray for them. We pray for the United Methodist Church, Lord, that you would help us to hang on to our birthright and our heritage while also looking forward to how we can be the church you call us to be in a new age. Help us, Lord, to love and care for all those around us. Help us to know that you love each and every one of us so very much and that that love carries us through. Help us, Lord, to prefer nothing to Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. This time we're going to share together in our offering. Please come as God, or please give as God leads you to the work of God's church.
Bless, Lord, the gifts that have been given in your name today. We thank you, Lord, for new members of our church. We thank you, Lord, for your love and grace that fills us. We thank you, Lord, that we have opportunity to seek to be your people. Bless us, Lord, in worship as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please remain standing as you feel able as we sing our closing song together. As we leave this house of worship, as we go out into the world, help us to go in the name and the love of Jesus Christ, sharing with a world that hurts. Help them to know that God loves them. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>